Welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 159th Social Environment. I'm Sophia Pedlow, and I have the pleasure of being your MC today for a conversation between Louis Fertino and Louis Block. We're also thrilled to have the poet Una Quack here, who will read to close today's program. Uh, this October marks the Rails 20th anniversary, and we are committed to remaining independent, free, and accessible to all. Um, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that we are on the unceded territory of the Lenny Lenape, Canarsie, Shinecock, and Munsee peoples. We acknowledge the many indigenous nations with ties to this land, and we recognize that the Lenape still call Manhattan home. Um, the Brooklyn Rail also stands in solidarity with the uprising unfolding across the country following the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDab, Nina Pop, David McCatty, James Scurlock, Jamel Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Rayshard Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Fells, Toyin Salah, and so many, many, many more. And in response to generations of structural violence against Black communities, Black Lives Matter, and we will continue to support ongoing action in the struggle for racial justice. Um, before I introduce our hosts, we'd like to begin with a brief moment of silence. Thank you. Um, and now to introduce today's host, Louis Block is a painter based in Brooklyn. His writing has appeared in the Brooklyn Rail, Hyperallergic and Full Bleed Journal, and his work has been shown in Baltimore, Philadelphia, New Jersey, and Venice. He is also the production editor at the Rail, um, and he will be, he is joined today, presently, by uh, Louis Fertino, who was born in 1993 in Annapolis. Um, Lewis received his BFA in painting with concentration in illustration from the Maryland Institute College of Art, Baltimore in 2015. He is a recipient of a Fulbright Research Fellowship in Painting um, in Berlin from 2015 to 2016 and a Yale Norfolk Painting Fellowship uh, in 2014. Fertino lives and works in Brooklyn, New York, which we love. Um, and the artist's first institutional solo exhibition will open at the Des Moines Art Center in November 2021. Um, the two of them actually met at MICA. So um, I'll hand it over to you both. Thank you. Thanks, Sophia. Um, so happy to be having this conversation with my fellow Lewis today. Um, I think it will be exciting. And welcome, Lewis. And I think, uh, here you go, should be able to activate your microphone now. There we go. Yeah, All right. here I am. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Thank you guys for having me. I'm just gonna pull up the slides right now so we can get into it. So your current show at Sigma Jenkins, uh, it's your second solo show at the gallery. And I think we should just start with the first painting in the show. Um, it's sort of on the left as you enter into the gallery and it's a medium medium sized canvas. Um, it's a figure looking at a, an open book uh, with George O'Keefe's radiator building painting to it. Um, and I think it's a really strong start to the show and it reminded me of the beginning of your last show at the same gallery because you have again a figure and a skyscraper um, in the opening room. And I wondered if there was a a connection there, any significance to those two motifs being represented again? Yeah, there was. I was kind of playing with the idea that the two shows could talk to each other because I definitely was thinking a lot about that show while I was making this one. Um, I think when I made the first show, it was a little bit more like trying my best to show a really wide range of ability with the pain and my interests in subject matter. And so I wasn't really thinking about it as a specific body of work. It was more kind of like the work that I was happiest with once Install came up. Um, and this second show felt really different that it, I wanted to have more specificity, um, feel more like one body of work and not kind of like just one long changing body, which is maybe more how I thought about the work when I had been showing it less frequently. So it was sort of, I wanted it to be a nod to that and a nod to 
the setting of the show. I, I always want the shows to feel like they relate to this place and this time specifically. Um, and I think the shift in scale was important to me too, to kind of clue the viewer into a, a tonal shift in the work. Like the self portrait was so large and the Chrysler building was not a huge painting, but it was bigger than how it was represented here. So I think it was kind of a way to instruct the viewer to maybe zoom out from the last show and be open to something a little bit different, but to bear it in mind or something like that. And could you tell us a bit about the time span um, that all these works were made in? Because they're all from this year, or they're dated 2020. Yeah, they pretty much are. Um, there are two paintings that were finished before 2020. And then Sikama invited me to do the show in January of this year. So pretty much I started the body of work in earnest from January until just last month. It's a pretty amazing output for such a small amount of time. Well, I kind of had nothing else to do, like so many of us, you know. Um, right. Studio, I was really fortunate that I could, I share it with my boyfriend, Tom Barger, and we have just been here all shut down. It's just us in this kind of garage, old garage building. So I feel really lucky that I wasn't in like a residency program, some things that I've done where I wouldn't have had any access to the space. Right. So, yeah, it was kind of nice to just hunker down and, and make the work. So I also wanted to talk about this painting that's in the, the first room because it's a, uh, slightly unusual for you or might look unusual for people that are uh, coming into the show. Um, and I wanted to ask about the, the different way that you approach painting a subject. Um, here you have animals. Um, so how, how do you approach painting a still life or a landscape or something like this, um, a scene, a fish market scene versus the human figure, which you're so used to depicting? Yeah. Because there are moments of tenderness like this octopus or squid that's upside down is, it's a little bit more pink in person than in this reproduction, but it's, it's tender and almost erotic or something. Um, but then there, these fish are so stiff compared to the, the figures. Yeah, I think I wanted to, I specifically paired the nude and this next to each other because I wanted to have people maybe think about the work on a more even playing field in a certain way. I felt like the work started to have a really specific and kind of narrow spot in the art world in some way. And I think that this fish painting, I did make it because I'm happy you feel like it's kind of a strange one for me um, in a way to kind of enliven the way you could look at the figure. Um, and we're going to talk about the flies and stuff that are in the show, but I think it also felt to me like it was kind of complicating the circumstance to think about like painting youth or painting my body or something like that, that it's related to my thought about the natural world, about impermanence um, also, and not just about kind of celebratory desire or, or an erotic inquiry or something like that. Um, I think something that's interesting painting animals, it, like there's also the painting of the swift in this show, is there looking for a kind of like essentialism in them? Whereas maybe I don't think about that so much painting like specifically Tom or myself or my family. Um, I was reading Delacroix's journals over the summer and he was talking about a group of painters that he felt were like Homeric painters. Like they were like Homer kind of just naming things in the world like fish, bird, mosquito. And I do feel like I come at painting from a kind of similar position, which is just curious about something I've experienced and kind of in love with it because of how beautiful I find it. And so maybe there's also kind of like an essential, looking for an essential quality in these animals, because I don't know them personally or as individuals the same way I would a person or a, a room. And the, the essentialism that you're talking about, um, is it going beyond a, a formal essentialism that's just um, optical or related to the, the shapes that you can draw within the figures? I think 
I think so. I think it's like many artists wanting to kind of get at the root of something or at the root of their curiosity for something. I forget who was the artist that was trying to make like the most chair chair or the most like lamp lamp or something like that. I think sometimes painting the animals can feel like that in a certain way mm -hmm. or they function like that. Like they're kind of, um, accent motifs in relation to the figurative work. Um, so it's not so much about the specific experience of seeing a fish market as it is I, the idea of a fish market in my mind. Though this one did come from kind of, it's like a combination of some that I've seen. And it's just something I'm attracted to constantly taking photos of them whenever I see it. Yeah. And this next painting, which is in the, the large room of the gallery, I, would, I kept going back and forth between these, the fish market painting and this one, um, even though the scale is so different, but it, it's sort of easy to see like the, the fish shapes here in the calves um, and there's the same uh, flowing composition. Uh, yeah. But this, this seems to be like, for me, maybe the, the center of the show, um, a very important uh, piece for the show. This was the first one I made for the, this body of work. Um, and I, I'm happy you kind of picked up on the fish shapes, the organic forms and the legs. Cause I feel like that's also part of wanting to make that painting of the fish because for me, it's sort of like complicating or equalizing my interest in representing the body that it's maybe more about my interest in how I perceive the world or the natural world and not always so related to a conversation around identity. Um, this painting also, I think, kind of parallel to that, trying to complicate the conversation around my work, where I wanted to zoom in on a specific part of the body in a way that it kind of didn't encourage the people seeing my work to say, oh, who, who is that? Is it you? Because I sort of feel that that's not the conversation I really want to be having. I'm not really trying to create like a voyeuristic space um, in the paintings. And so I think focusing on the legs and the feet, even though they're taking cues from my body or my bedroom, it's more about um, so something different the viewer can empathize with, not necessarily making them feel like they're seeing something private. And even if the some of the paintings are uh, overtly autobiographical, it's interesting to think that some of them may be depicted from a first person observational perspective and others are removed. You're looking at yourself in a, a scene or through a mirror in the third person. Um, and talking about perspective, I know it's a cliche of these talks perhaps, but uh, we often talk about this Paolo Cello painting in reference to um, other paintings, uh, other painters' works. And it's such a good one to talk about um, in reference to this, I think Fong called it ecstatic perspective the other day, which is a great phrase to think about. Um, yeah, I, The way that the, I, the flatness of the legs in the front just creates this division with the, the vertiginous uh, background, um, I think relates so much to what you're doing with this head that's peeking out over like a mountain of sheets in the background. I love that phrase, like ecstatic perspective. I feel like, you know, it's a question from modernism of like, how do we create images that are more related to the way we perceive the world and trying to get closer and closer to that. And I feel that I agree with the whole project of modernism, which is that it doesn't look like a photograph or like reality, that it feels like space you can move through or a space that can confuse you. Um, and I think that's part of why I also love that painting so much. Um, where, yeah, it throws you into the middle of this battle that happened so long ago and, and you can really travel through the space. I think also something that's coming up is playing with scale of this work because quite a few of these paintings are um, pretty big compared to the works that I made when I first moved to New York and trying to make sure that they make a case for themselves to be that size. And maybe in that painting, it's 
making the viewer small or something like that. Um, in the same yeah. way, changing the perspective changes how big you are, how you are in the space. I wanted to talk about scale and I think um, this might be a good comparison to make because these are two paintings in, in the show, um, both dinner table scenes, but um, this one is about a foot tall on the left, I think. Um, yeah. Whereas this, this one on the right is seven, eight feet tall, maybe. Yeah. Um, so if you, maybe you could talk about, um, in reference to painting a, a specific scene like this, um, even though it's not the scene, it's a, a similar motif, um, that difference in scale. And in a, a former interview, you talked about small paintings for you as being inherently intimate and erotic just because of the scale. Um, and in that way, sort of existing as queer objects um, in contrast to like a large heroic painting. Um, maybe you could touch on that as well. Yeah, I, I think that my interest in making small scale works came, really came about when I graduated from school and couldn't afford to be in a big space and couldn't afford to spend an exorbitant amount of money on materials. So I was focusing on these small paintings and then really starting to respect them, not as like a supporting cast of characters to the larger work. And really identifying as someone who made small paintings, um, like around 2016, and the way they were talked about helped me realize that I think there was kind of a queer identity there, that something didn't need to beat you over the head to be important, or um, it could ask you to meet it on its own terms, which I think there is a kind of a queer, a queer politic going on there. Um, and I think as a painter, there's a formal interest in trying to push myself in both directions where I'm like, I've got a little bit more resources so I can make larger works. I'm showing in larger spaces, but feeling like I should also be making even smaller work and pushing myself in the opposite direction to kind of expand both ways um, and not let this heroic or monumental thing eclipse my interest in smallness or quietness or uh, that kind of eroticism, which comes from, yeah, getting very close to something or feeling like you could take care of it or something like that. And you were in um, Berlin for about a year, right? Um, after school. Yeah. Um, and so I imagine having to deal with making work on a, on a scale or in a format that could be brought back to the States um, that, w that was probably a con consideration there, right? Yeah, also the Fulbright sounds like a lot of money when you're applying for it and then you get there and it's not a bunch. So it was kind of like what I could afford to make there. Um, and I think that was a really nice time for me because nobody was asking to see that work or show it. And so it takes a lot of the pressure off of things that you feel even in school, like at Micah, I'm sure you remember, you, wanna, you want it to seem obvious that you're working hard. And so sometimes scale is something that can do that. But then when I was in the studio in Berlin, it was sort of like, well, once you finished a painting, it just moved from one side of the studio to the other. So it didn't really make sense. Um, and I think focusing on paintings at that scale helped me develop and kind of refine my language because I could start and finish them so much faster and treat them a little bit more experimentally. And could you talk a bit about um, the series that you're making in Berlin and what, did you have an advisor there? I actually did not. It was pretty free. Um, I ended up enrolling at Humboldt University, which is not an art school. And um, I didn't actually end up taking any classes. I just sort of got to pretend to be a full-time artist for the first time, like for the first year out of school, which was amazing. And I just, made work um, every day. And I think a funny thing about my practice is that the content of it has really not changed. I mean, I made paintings of my family, even as a teenager, and then in college was doing the same thing. And then in Berlin, it shifted because the locale had, but I was still painting my boyfriend at the time, my roommates, the bridges I would cross on my way to the studio. So I do feel like the work is all kind of one body of work. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm going to go backwards a bit. Um, this, these two paintings are also really big, about eight feet tall. Um, and the, this is the titular piece. The show is titled Morning. Um, and I wanted to ask about that, the choice to title the show Morning. Um, compared with some of your other titles of former shows, it's a little more, um, a little less direct, I would say, or more enigmatic. Um, and that maybe there's a mood that's slightly different um, in this new series that's shifting. Um, the word, it's not as, as charged. Um, yeah. Demure is a word that comes to mind um, and not in a bad way. They're, it, maybe they're more reflective. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think so. I think that I was thinking a lot about how to respond to this year in a way that was honest about what my life looked like in relation to quarantine and protests in New York and um, a lot of upheaval all over the world. And I feel like I maybe wanted to just quiet down a little bit or, or try to shift the focus of the work to a place that could be more universal in some way and not so focused on my desire or my body. And so I think that's why, like in the last penny reference, I tried to physically push the figures to the outskirts of the composition to try to get the show to be about something that could maybe be more universal, which was just light. Um, and I think that was also something I was interested in as someone who's talk, whose work is talked about in a specifically queer context that I can be interested in light falling on form also, and that that's a legitimate um, inquiry for me, that it, I don't kind of have to, to perform this idea of a uh, queer identity maybe. Um, so I think those, there were a lot of things coming together that made the show happen, but I, I'm glad that it feels different. I felt like the show needed to feel different from the last show and I wanted it to feel true to myself, that it was still about all the things that I make work about all the time, but could accommodate some of the more in-between feelings we've all been dealing with this year, which is, yeah, quietness or solitude or, um, I don't know. I guess that's why I make them into paintings. Hard for me to talk about sometimes. And especially in a composition like this, um, in person, your eye just goes around and around. There's there's so many different focal points, even though the perspective is very um, skewed towards the, the top with all of those guiding lines. I mean, um, there's this, there are all these little pinpoints of focus that you can spend a ton of time looking at in front of the painting. Yeah, I like the idea that my paintings could be thought of as kind of, um, objects that are like uh, the residue of memory or something like that, that it's like a, a physical manifestation of a memory. Um, because This one was particularly fun to make because I was making it of the backyard of the apartment I'm in in Clinton Hill. And I spend every morning kind of, this is the first time I've ever had outdoor space. So I've been so excited to watch plants grow from seed and things change. And so it's sort of like this record of time passing or my memory of the space to be like those sunflowers I planted bloomed or closed or um, the tomatoes, you know, got new things on it or the squash blossoms are just opening. So it was really like being able to move through my memory of the space to make this painting, um, which is how all the work is made really kind of using things from my memory. And I'm interested in how I enlarge things or forget things. Um, and because there are some things in, like the gutter I just forgot about. Um, and it's like, I'm curious after making them why in some way. I think it relates. I was reading some writing that Matisse had done because I was also trying to make this work about light, um, about my interest in this quality of light. That's part of why I titled the show Morning. And he was saying, I'm going to paraphrase, but 
making art is a lot like love because it's about the quality of the projection, which I thought on the surface is kind of a nihilistic way to feel about love. But I think it's also true because it's kind of about like the vision you bring to it. And I think it's also the same for the memories of our lives where our mind is changes what we've experienced so dramatically. And I think the paintings are kind of doing that also in some way. There are often these moments of artworks within artworks in your paintings. Um, I wanted to look specifically at this one, the Richardson Street living room, um, and this carpet with the leopard figure, I think. Um, then this, I believe, is the original drawing that that carpet was based on. Yeah. Is that true? Um, and it reminds me of this beware of dog mosaic in Pompeii, which is so funny. Um, it's funny you bring up mosaic in relation to the rug, because the next one I want to make is kind of based on that mosaic called the unswept floor. Um, which is all, do you know that one where it's like just bits of food? Yeah. Um, so it's definitely in my mind somehow, this like connection to mosaic and the rugs, but yeah, it's one that I made just for this apartment that's painted was the, is the first place I had ever lived by myself. And so I kind of went all in like making things for it. And then if we look at this one, um, Polaroids on the kitchen counter, there are obviously these Polaroids here, um, which I'm assuming you took, but um, they're actually pasted. They're separate uh, paintings that have then been pasted and collaged on the canvas. Um, yeah. And the ceramic, which I also believe that you made. Yeah, um, actually, the ceramics pretty much, save for some that my grandmother made on the windowsill, um, are ones that I made. So there is sort of this mise en beam thing happening, and I think. I'm hoping that by becoming like so personal or so specific that the paintings maybe become a little bit harder to resolve in some way. Mm -hmm. I, so you have this, this mode of working where you're just, you're building off of these, um, these artworks that you have that then become sort of redigested in, into the practice. Um, how do you mediate between the, that mode of working and then, um, you know, just taking a blank page and and starting over? Um, do you think about those as separate processes, or is it all being continuously digested at once? Is there ever a moment where you're like, I have to put away these these other projects and just start with a white canvas? Um. Yeah, I, I know that you wanted to ask me about the animations and I think maybe mm -hmm. I think about those as kind of like an antidote to this kind of work, which can start to feel like it answers too many questions where I'm like, well, where did it happen? How, what was the light like? What time of day? What season? Who was with me? What was I cooking? Like, it can be a lot to answer to and can start to feel kind of heavy. And so I have this other part of my practice where I make stop motion animation animation where it's really fun to play with impossible things that the body could do, like consume itself or um, take its skin off like a jacket or something like that, which are kind of themes that I don't allow myself so much in the painting, which feels so much more like world building and not like um, these kind of impossible gestures. Do you think that that's due to the difference in the medium, the, the fact that you're moving towards different subjects and themes or do you think it's um more related to the fact that it maybe it feels more experimental and you're you're given that freedom it's probably both i mean it, it requires an incredible amount of drawing to make a very short video so it forces me to draw in a way that i'm not really used to drawing when i'm drawing from observation or from memory where i can kind of luxuriate in the details of things i have to become very economic and that changes the style of them. But I think it also probably relates to the history um, of painting, which is immense. And 
and can feel really serious, whereas the history of animation is much more recent and maybe feels more playful in my mind or more possible to accommodate those kind of ideas. I also wanted to show these works from a show last year at Antoine Levy Gallery in Paris. And you did a, I don't know if residency is the right word, but you worked with a studio in Al, uh, Albasola yeah. in, near Genoa. Um, yeah. Can you talk about that process? These are terracotta. Uh, right, yeah, these are, these are just um, basically raw terracotta with a manganese oxide wash use kind of like ink to draw on them. Um, I was referencing specifically the work of a sculptor that I was really excited about who's working in that region named Arturo Martini, who also made a series of bas relief sculpture. And um, I had only a month to make this show. So I think I was trying to set myself some parameters to make it actually possible where I just sort of used his work and used drawings that I've made before I arrived um, and tried to marry the two of them. Um, and that was amazing. I mean, the, the town is really special. It's not very famous anymore, but Fontana worked there. We afraid of lamb worked there. Um, Arturo Martini. And so it's covered in ceramics. So it was a really special place to be and something I want to continue doing, but it's nice to be able to go and have that only that to do. Whereas my primary interest in painting kind of, takes over sometimes in the studio. And you've done, um, you sort of have a history of making ceramics. Right? I've always been interested in ceramics. My grandmother, Peggy Richard, is a ceramicist. And so I've been around ceramics since I was a child. And, and I think my interest in the home or um, history of kind of daily life makes me deeply interested in them too. So I think it's something I'll always do, um, but I think I wanna make some larger ones. These ones are quite small. They're probably only like around that big, the biggest. Um, but I think they're similar to my interest in oil paint or in charcoal or pastel where you can kind of transform very organic, humble material into something that's recognizable, has, um, you know, an emotional quality to it, has, takes you somewhere else. I love that taking these really elemental, really basic things um, is really exciting to me. So this is a painting from your last show at Sigma Jenkins um, last year called Metropolitan, and it's the Metropolitan Bar. Yeah, I think it's a good example of a painting that wouldn't have been made for this year's body of work. Right. I, th I think this might be like the most, one of the most reproduced paintings of yours that I see um, okay. on social media, at least. Um, and I have, I believe this is the reference drawing or yeah. one of the reference drawings. So I wanted to talk about um, your source material. I know you you're drawing all the time, but you also look at uh, photographs, you draw from observation, from memory. Can you talk about the, the drawing process and what you're looking at actively while you're drawing and also the translation from drawing to painting and if paintings ever happen without a, a sketch beforehand? Yeah, um, certainly paintings sometimes happen without a drawing, but drawing such an important part of the process that then I might have to make a drawing from uh, a very early stage of the painting. I think it's really important to make drawings because you kind of can think about the composition of them in a more active way. Whereas when you're working on a super large scale, you can kind of get lost in them. Um, I think it's probably why sometimes painters use projection um, to make their work because you can kind of keep your sensibility at a small scale, at a large scale. So that's why I use the sketchbook and draw from them a lot. But I think I also, I have a different mentality kind of related to what we're talking about with animations where it doesn't really matter what the drawing is about because it's just a drawing. And it's because that's kind of the way we think about drawings maybe that they're made of this very thin material. They're just pastel like dust or or ink, 
made of cheap things. So it's easy to make things that don't work out. And often because I'm in that kind of like willing to fail state of mind, the, the things that really matter come out. Um, so I kind of feel like I was talking to a friend. I sort of feel like sometimes being in the studio is like being a, an attendant, like a parking garage attendant or something where your ideas just sort of drive in and out and you just have to be there. And, and then a really beautiful one will kind of drive through all of a sudden and you just have to sort of be in the right state of mind to, to notice it. And I think drawing really gets me there easily because it's something I can do so automatically have been doing for forever. Um, these, this is a good example of drawings that maybe have like one from a photograph and the other from a Warhol photograph of, um, I can't remember who, really famous, but name is, escapes me, of a, of a woman, but has been transformed into myself or some, a body more easily identifiable within kind of my cast of characters. I also talk about- and I just- Oh, well, oh go ahead. Go ahead. As I've talked about drawing the way I understand it too, as sort of like a game of telephone in a certain way where it's about taking something and then letting yourself distort it until it becomes yours. Um, I think that's kind of how I think about working from photography um, or other artworks in a certain way where if I'm purposely lax about how I observe something, all of a sudden I start to creep in and then it becomes mine again, or I feel comfortable that I can call it mine and, and, and use it for my own work. Maybe one of the reasons this picture seems to be so popular, um, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful painting, but it's also a bit different in that it's, um, it's a very public space, not, not a private space that you're depicting. Um, but I was recently reading uh, a new text in the new Wolfgang Tillman's book. Um, and he talks about, he makes this connection between the photographic dark room and the dark, the physical dark room of a, a club um, as this space that even though it's public is actually, um, a queer space that allows for freedom because of the darkness and is a, a place for transformation and um, the same kind of magical feeling that you get from a photographic dark room where anything seems possible. Yeah, um, I think that's, I, I, it's hard for me to paint well lit public spaces. Like I, in that last show, there was the bridges at night, the city at night, um, but lights, things that have light on them require a lot of information. And I think painting people I don't know um, feels like it bears different kinds of responsibilities than painting things that I can point to that I know very intimately. And I think that painting, yeah, the club, there's kind of an anonymous quality to the figures around you because of the changing lights and the darkness that maybe gave me license to paint a crowd or, or paint people moving in a way that it would have been a different kind of painting to do like a street during the day, which is something I want to be able to make and feel like I'm working on getting there. I love this, uh, maybe we can zoom in, this little moment here of the figure staring in between from the, yeah. the kissing couple. Um, and it's not in the drawing, so it, I, I'm assuming it happened sort of in the, the painting process you found that space. Yeah, I like to keep the drawings for the paintings pretty, minimal because I discover a lot through the painting like that, like possibilities in the painting that just wouldn't have happened in the drawing. Um, so they change quite a bit. And I think it's often these kind of final things that really make the painting, like I think that little face makes the emotional tone of this painting a more realistic one where you can also feel kind of alone or zoned out or awkward in these kind of spaces, even though it's also really celebratory and, and exciting. So I wanted to talk about this painting called Swift and Mosquito and this painting called Hill. This is quite small, um, probably like eight, eight by 12 or something. Like yeah. Um, and this is maybe three, four feet across. Yeah. Um, 
these are in the current show and they're in a way very uh, different because they, it's not that um, all of your paintings have figures in them, but there, there isn't even a, um, a trace of a figure uh, in these or something that indicates that someone has been there. And I think we could make comparisons to Arthur Dove or Georgia O'Keeffe, but um, Marston Hartley as well. Yeah, I'm happy those painters are on the surface. I think my interest in Picasso and Matisse is very present um, in all of my work, but I maybe started to feel like my other interests were not being talked about or weren't noticed. And I think some of this work was me trying to bring them a little bit closer to the surface, specifically in like Arthur Dove and Georgia O'Keeffe, because I think I'm interested in making American paintings and I wanted there to be a sense of American modernism as a direct lineage for this work and not just um, some of the other artists that are more commonly talked about for my work. Because I think there's sometimes a too easy way of understanding the work, which is kind of like making an inversion of Picasso looking at the female nude, which I think to me feels a little bit too calculating, a little bit too figured out, a little too neat. And I feel like O'Keeffe and Hartley make work that's harder to kind of say, well, this is the inverse of that, or this is the, the queer version of it or something. Um, I think there's a universality to that kind of interest or something. Um, in another interview, maybe several other interviews, you've talked about the, this frustrating fact that art history is divided into you know, queer history versus hegemonic cis history. Um, yeah. And why, can, why can't they just be combined into one? Why is that not the, um, the remedy at this point? And well, it's I know, maybe <laughs> Marston Hartley is a good figure to talk about. Uh, in that vein. Right. Yeah, because I, I think because my belief is, sorry, not such that they can be combined, but that they very much are. Um, and it just takes some looking to notice that. Like, it's always kind of baffles me when there's this well-meaning intention comment, like, for the first time this work is being made, like, me and, then, and a group of young queer figurative artists, but it's like been made for so long and in so many forms. Um, and so I think that's part of, yeah, trying to have partly be very much present and even like lesser known artists like Charles DeMuth or um, George Platt Lines, like people who maybe aren't talked about in terms of the canonical art history, but are important to me. Myron Stout is also someone that comes to mind, especially with this one for me. And I, it's a strange reference to make, but I, I keep seeing oh. Myron Stout. Is it contemporary of Hartley? I believe so, yeah. Oh, okay. I'll have to. But I can completely abstract uh, black and white paintings, oh, small okay. scale. Um, let's look at these two paintings. Um, in the same room called May and July, which seem almost like companion pieces to me, but maybe they weren't meant that way. Um, but they're both about this basin. Um, one is a bath, one is a sink. And I'm assuming this is a Mybridge print here? That's actually a miser, a uh, Bob Miser. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but there's, there's such a play of uh, reflections and angles, um, and even there's this little reflection in the faucet there. Um, so many little details to find in this one, which is uh, sort of a common mode of painting for you that felt um, familiar to me. And then this painting, July, felt like a departure in terms of its um, all overness is a bad word, but um, the handling of the details versus the large forms felt um, the same in a way that that's that's not uh, familiar for your painting. Yeah, I definitely was pulling back a little bit on in the painting titled July, not have needing every kind of contour 
to be fully described, um, not needing all the information to be so observed. Um, and I think that came with this meditation on light or a quality of light, feeling like it could actually get in the way of it um, if I had done that, gone into every little corner and painted the dust and the, you know, crumble from the mortar and, and all that. But I think it's fair to call them companion pieces. Um, yeah, I, I think- I was wondering if, while I was looking at them, if we could sort of say like, this one is a memory, uh, July is a memory and May is a deeply observed scene in the moment, but maybe that's, maybe I'm on the wrong track there. No, I think it's interesting as they relate to memory because actually I moved from one apartment to the other and the apartment was really where all these paintings kind of started because that was mostly where I have been for the past year. And the bathroom painted in May is the apartment I lived in for two years. And so I knew very well that space and the things that I'd seen in it, I saw every day, two or three times a day. So maybe there's a resolution to the memory there that you don't see depicted in July, which is the painting I moved into this past July. So I've only been there a couple months now. Um, so I think it's fair to correlate, yeah, the sort of time or intimacy with the space and the resolution maybe is a good word for it. Mm -hmm. So speaking, uh, oh, and there, here's this other image of a, a basin that um, I believe is the promotional image for the show. Um, and it, you can't tell, again, in the reproduction, but here's a spoon with peanut butter, I'm guessing. Um, and it's, the paint is really smeared on and three-dimensional uh, in, the, in the physical uh, yeah, space. Was, I feel like it's hard to paint food in some way because it's all sort of brownish and abstracted and and so like the, in the meal painting I kind of conveniently chose for the, the dinner to be over because I was like I cannot paint a lasagna like and make that look good um but the peanut butter was because I was trying to figure out how to paint it and then I realized the sort of like ochre paint I had just was physically peanut butter basically and just kind of slammed it on and I think in the same way I treated the collage polaroids like just uh, small pieces of cardboard that I painted. So they actually cast small shadows on the flat surfaces that I'd sort of tilted up onto the surface of the painting. Mm -hmm. um. So speaking about small details, this was sort of the main, the main thing that had me running back and forth between paintings in okay. your show. Um, all of these flies and this is a mosquito in the Swift painting. Um, and various insects. There are so many more than I've pictured here, but these are just some details. Um, and I'm assuming most of these, all of them were painted before the, the Mike Pence incident with the fly on the head. Um, so very prescient of you, but also um, sort of referencing back this Renaissance convention of painting a trompe l'oeil fly, which I believe uh, in the, um, the Vasari story of Giotto, he fools uh, Chimabue with a, a realistic depiction of a fly and Chimabue tries to swat it away only to realize that his student has become a better painter than he. Um, but there are also connotations with like pestilence and sin that flies have. So I was wondering if you could talk about this decision because I haven't, I don't think I've seen them in former paintings. because they seem like a new addition. Yeah, it's actually, I'll kind of describe how I decided to paint them in. I, I went back to Micah in March and I stayed with Joe's mail for the night that I was there. And she, act, I had forgotten that I'd given her some of my work and it was up in her home, which was really touching. And we were talking about my work as a student, which ha did include all these insects. Um, and she was talking about, how what she liked so much about my work at that point was that kind of everything meant something almost in like a folk art tradition where you only kind of describe what you're trying to communicate in a certain way. And that was in March. So it was sort of right when I was hitting my stride making this body of work. And I think it really shifted how I was thinking about making these paintings where I was returning to this 
mentality of making like paintings within paintings or focusing on this uh, accumulation of small details to create a new kind of realism for myself. Um, but I also like that painting the insects first demands of the viewer a kind of new sensitivity to looking closely. It's sort of like used as a signifier to say that you, sh you should look very closely. And also trying to kind of complicate the idea of what's beautiful about the paintings. I think um, trying to use paint as a way to say that the things that maybe are commonly described as dirty or like you're saying associated with pestilence or or uncleanliness could be thought of as just part of our world and and that we could have a more generous way of looking at the world in a certain way um yeah but i think also like the dead fish and um wanting the paintings to feel like they are not just about youth and beauty in a certain way, but that they're made in relationship to a more, I don't know, knowing that life is complicated and will change. And they're often painted with a brush that's much smaller than the, the surrounding brush strokes around them. So they really do catch your eye and cause you to look at the details. Um, and when you isolate them like this, when you're up close in front of the canvas, that's really, that's the only recognizable form. Everything else is abstract. Yeah, which is kind of the way probably bugs exist in the world. And maybe, I don't know, where everything is kind of like painted larger. So these are two images from your last show. Um, this is a detail on the left. Um, and I, I love this, the way that the curling hand um, speaks to the shell. And there are a lot of shells in, in your other works. Um, I wonder if we can talk about uh, morphology or like a personal iconography that you're starting to build, um, not only of symbols and motifs, but of shapes themselves. Because the way that you paint um, ears, a lot of other people have, have commented on is so um singular and is becoming like not really a rendition of a way that picasso renders ears or anything it, it's really like a louis Fertino ear that is recognizable are you aware of that maybe like the vocabulary of, of symbols and shapes that you're building i think in regards to the snail shell or the spiral shell and the insects i'm thinking about who gets offered a connection to the natural world or I sometimes think about how when you are making work that's understood as being made by a minority identity that there are maybe like these kind of essential things that aren't allowed to be talked about in that context and I think like the natural world is one of those things where it's kind of like that belongs to of other people or some do you know do you kind of understand where I'm, where I'm going with this I wish I could speak about it a little more articulately um in the, in the same way where it's like hegemonic art history like Picasso belongs to straight artists um like the natural world belongs to people who don't have to worry about you know their social rights and and I feel like it's like trying to assert that there is a connection to biology and to geology and to the history of the earth to be queer, to be a gay person, um, that it's not some kind of new phenomenon. Um, so that's where that comes from. But in terms of the way I render eyes or ears, um, I don't think it's something I'm very conscious of necessarily. I think it really comes from being satisfied by abstract forms that um, feel like they work for me and liking that my work could have a set of motifs that pop up again and again in an almost literary way.
I think that that was a, a great answer to that question. That was maybe a hard question. No, no. Um, thanks. Um, so you have a um, your first institutional solo show um, at a museum in Iowa coming up next year. Do you want to talk about how you're preparing for that? Is it going to be all new work or uh, sort of a survey? It's, um, I think a survey is a bizarre term to use for a four year practice. Um, right. So I, I won't say that, but it, it will include older work or work that has been made. Um, I think the earliest work in that show will probably be from 2017. Um, and then I'll probably make about 10 new paintings for that show. And I'm really excited to have a show in Iowa um, because I think that I'm so lucky to live in New York where the dialogue around queerness and around painting, um, it's just, it's a real privilege to be among people that largely feel similarly to me. And I think being somewhere like in Iowa, it's, it's a different context for this kind of work. And to me, it feels like the ultimate privilege to kind of maybe give power to the work simply by the environment it's in. So I'm really excited about it. Great, well, we're looking forward to it. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to put one last slide up as a closing thought, since you're talking about environment. Um, you grew up in, outside of Annapolis, right? In Maryland? Yeah, yeah. Um, in a pretty rural environment near to the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and I remember seeing your, your early paintings and they had this very specific light to them and they were images of summer storms that were very much connected to the, the Chesapeake area. Um, and I think it's so easy to, to say that New York artists belong in New York and it, it's undeniable that like you've, you've found your, your niche in New York. Um, but I just wanted to ask you about um, growing up and uh, your experience before coming here. And so this is a, a terracotta piece from the Antoine Levy show in, last year. Um, and it's you and your siblings in bed and your parents there and titled Fratinos, which is a lovely title. Um, and here's the, the reference Romanesque carving, uh, The Dream of the Magi from Autun. Yeah, I... Um, so that's a lot, but I, I just wanted to, to ask you about your, uh, I, your when I saw New York. the question earlier today, I thought about, I was reading about Louise Gluck who passed away recently. And I remember I had chanced upon this thing she had written, which was, we look at the world once in childhood and the rest is memory. And I thought that that was so beautiful and so true of the way we kind of live through projections of the world, kind of like I was talking about before. And so it's almost like all summer light is Maryland light for me, if, I, if that's true or, or something like that. And so I definitely carry with me being in that kind of very natural environment. And maybe my, even if I'm in New York, I'm still excited by mosquitoes and birds and flies and things because I think that she's right, that it's like, that is the first time you see the world. It's the first time you kind of going through the world, naming things as you encounter them, which is fantastic. And um, I think painting my family is also related to painting the birds and, and the landscapes where I don't know a lot of queer work that is about your parents and everyone has parents and siblings. And so I think it's important to me thematically specifically in a queer context um, to make work like this. And at a but, more basic level, work is always about the things that I love. And so it's an easy, easy place to go for me. I think that's a, a great place to end maybe. Um, I think we have some, some questions coming in from the audience. So maybe it would be a good time to transition if you have some more energy left to answer them. Yeah, definitely. Great. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sophia, do we have audience questions? Indeed we do. A bunch more just um, just rolled in too. Thank you for such a beautiful tour um, and such 
such candid responses. I'm, we do, I'm gonna start with a question from Danilo, um, who just had to hop off, um, but I will read it on his behalf and he's gonna, this goes for everybody, um, you're able to watch this on our website and on YouTube kind of in perpetuity. So if there's anything that you missed or wanna revisit, um, it's there for your viewing pleasure or to share with friends. Um, so Danilo wanted to know, um, what limitations do you see to identity forward readings of your work? I'm thinking of the trap door of representation um, and I'm curious to hear about your thoughts on that. I think the, the only, well, I wanna, I guess I'll start by saying, I remember reading a Toni Morrison quote where she was asked if she would ever write about white people and she kind of was, I'm really gonna butcher this because she's amazing, but um, she was saying like, there's no need for her to transcend her identity. And I, that kind of hit me really hard where it was kind of like in school, I remember sort of the conversation was like, oh, but you don't really want to be like the gay painter. And that was never something I felt. And, and hearing her say that really cemented that for me, where it was like, the work's already transcendent. Like being, being gay is already at a transcendent point. So there's no need to, to feel like you can't be that. But I think that the way in which our work is consumed is different. And, and I think that there can be a narrowness, which is more about how straight society or straight people understand gay people that can be limiting, where the, the only signifiers can be sex or um, a conventionally beautiful body or something like that. And those are dangerous and things that I don't want my work to participate in. And so I think that's why I don't think I've tried to shift my work away from a queer identity in any way, but have tried to make it more truthful by being more complicated. Gorgeous, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, next one, I'm gonna pass the mic to iPhone. Sorry, I don't know your name because you're listed as iPhone, but you just asked a great question in the chat. Um, you should be able to turn on your mic now. Oh, hi. Um, thank you so much for sharing your beautiful work. Um, and my question has to do with like colors. Um, as a painter and a lot, of, I, I feel like you put a lot of thought into the color of each painting and it's definitely like thought and planned out. And I'm curious as to like how you prep your palette or how you plan color when you're about to start a painting. Like do you mix, do you have like a pre-mixed palette or do you just have like, I don't know, 28 colors and you just kind of like go with the flow on the day um, where you find your color inspiration. And then my other question has to do with like, I'm always curious about like artists' daily ske schedules or rituals um, or like, you know, like I think of like Chris Ophelia, he wakes up every morning and does a watercolor. I'm just wondering if you, uh, like what your day in your life is like. Yeah, um, thank you. I, in regards to color, I feel sometimes like I'm cheating by using oil paint because it's so beautiful just coming out of the tube. So I don't plan very much, actually. I kind of let it do what it does best, which it likes to be kind of abused and treated terribly. And then these colors that I could never have planned arrive um, by my kind of um, I don't know, bad attitude towards the paint in a certain way. And, and so one, I feel like the paintings, they really um, arrive at the right contrast towards the end, but it's a lot of just, yeah, being really kind of free with the paint and then choosing what grays and which browns and which in between greens and blues I'm gonna keep and then kind of refining them with, um, high key colors next to them so that there becomes uh, this kind of har more harmonious image. Um, but it really relies on chance, I think, and uh, kind of mess making. And I think oil painting offers that. Um, and in regards to my daily life in the studio, um, I benefit from routines and I treat the studio a lot like um, I treated work before I was able to work full time. I'm here from like 10 to six 
Monday through Friday, and I try not to come in on the weekends. Um, so that's it's pretty not very juicy information, I feel like, but um, works for me. Um, I'm lucky to share my studio with my boyfriend, so um, it's not as solitary as painting can be. Definitely get to share lunch with him every day and have somebody to ask, is this working or am I insane? And sometimes yes, sometimes no. Wonderful, thank you. Um, the beautiful ritual of sharing lunch. We miss yeah. it so, yeah. but luckily we have this space here in order to do it virtually with so many of our friends. <laughs> um, Michael, I'm gonna pass you the mic, okay? Um, you asked a question earlier in the conversation. Uh, you should be live now. Oh. I Maybe I will read on Michael's behalf. Um, he was wondering uh, why you chose to leave Instagram after providing so much content um, over the past few years. I'm sure it's not the first time you've been asked. But. Uh, yeah, I, I think I, I used it heavily. I used it to my advantage, I think. My first show that I got in New York was because the gallerist uh, noticed my work online and was a really powerful tool. It was super exciting at the time because I sort of felt like I could do 100 studio visits a day with people that didn't know who I was, which was amazing. Um, but I felt like I reached a point where I was spending a lot of time on it. I think everyone probably feels like they could spend a little bit less time on it, um, if you're like me. And um, it felt like it put pressure on my work to be seen sort of right away. I, I had a, like, I had two accounts. I had one that was just for drawings and it was kind of like, if I felt confident in a drawing, I just immediately wanted to blast it on social media and get sort of this instant gratification from it. And I think that did kind of change the way I make drawings in a way that's opposite to what I was talking about before, where the studio should be this place where you can fail, where you can want to fail. And I think social media kind of sets you up for the opposite mentality. Um, so that was part of it. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think I just was curious about what I would do with the time and didn't feel like it was serving me professionally necessarily in the same way. And I was tired of hearing myself say, I should spend less time on this. I probably should do something. And then, you know, so I just got rid of it in order to, to accomplish that. Thank you for your candor. Um, so we got a question from Charlie, our managing editor. So Charlie, take the mic. Thanks, Sophia. <clears throat> and thanks to both Lewis's for a very engaging conversation today. Um, Lewis, I was thinking about something that uh, Wayne Tebow said on our uh, broadcast that surprised me. And it was that uh, he has a, a significant practice of copying paintings um, that he admires. And I wondered if, if you did anything similar to that or, or, or generally how you respond in a haptic manner to, to paintings that you admire. Yeah, I actually do, I start a great number of paintings that way um, where it can feel so daunting to sit in front of a blank canvas or a blank sheet of paper and not know what to say or what to do. And I find the easiest way to get moving is just to find an image that I know works and to try to steal a bit from it um, by copying it really directly. So yeah, whether it's um, pulling the color from something like a Howard Hodgkin painting or drawing directly from a Matisse lithograph and then it becomes my own figure. Um, a lot of the work that I have, I'm trying to see if I have anything in here now that that way um not exactly but but it's a pretty common thing for me sorry i'm looking around like is is there anything and there is actually there's this one painting here from where i've just copied the drawing from a, actually a spanish comic artist named uh, rodrigo and and i just love the way he draws the body so i've started i first made i'll just show you guys since we're here now 
I wish I could show you the image, but I was looking at it on my phone. But this one was the drawing that I had made from the, like, I don't know what you call it, the cell in the comic. And then I've started making the painting here in a really early stage um, there. So I'll try to find that image so we can get an idea of how I kind of digest things. So it's a really common practice for me. Thanks, that was really informative. And I, as you kept turning your head, I kept turning mine as if I could see around the corner with you. This, uh, <laughs> This, yeah. this, this, this platform does funny things. Oh, yeah. thank you. <laughs> yeah. there you go. I love uh, the, the painting wall there with all of the touches of used, used paint yeah, on the I side. Yeah, paint a lot to make the paintings. So I kind of That's just great. wipe my fingers off on the wall to get them not so dirty, but I don't think that's the safest way to make paintings. I'm definitely not gonna encourage anybody to, to do that. But. Thank you, Lewis. Yeah. Um, amazing, such a, such a pleasure to get a little tour. Um, so I'm gonna read a question for, um, from Iran next, um, whose mic isn't working. Uh, they wanna know, was Robert Gobert influencing your recent show? I'm thinking specifically about his sculptural depictions of nature and landscape um, and basins. Oh, I, I love Robert Gobert and <laughs> I feel like an artist who I, would love to be but know that I never will be would be Robert Gober. I feel like I have a predilection for sweetness in a way that he kind of cuts straight through to the heart of things and I wish I could do that and maybe when I'm older I'll be able to. So he's in the back of my mind. I don't, I don't think I was referencing him so directly as I am referencing painting history um, and specific images from painting history such as the Hartley still life, those were definitely more conscious things, but I'm honored that he even crossed your mind with my work. And I hope that something he's accomplishing with the images of the landscape or the natural world and the queer identity are also happening in my work. And maybe the thinking is similar there. Thank you very much. Um, so I have a, another question lined up from Guest. Um, again, sorry, I don't know your name, unless it is Guest. But um, <laughs> passing you the mic. <laughs> uh, I can also read it for you. Uh, well, our, our guest in the audience was curious whether you have any advice for artists in the beginning stages of their studio practice. Um, and in particular, thoughts on whether living in the city, sorry, New York City, uh, as an artist is crucial or not? Mm. Well, I know that I've been wildly fortunate. And I think that's been a huge part of all of this. Um, but I think, and I think this is kind of irritating advice, but I think it's really true, is that you have to make the work that you're gonna make regardless of who's seeing it or who's buying it um, or who's writing about it. Otherwise, you're gonna be constantly performing something or disappointing yourself, kind of stuck thinking about what I'm, like why is what I'm making not working or not being seen. And I mean, that being said, I've been really lucky to have my work be supported by people early on, but I hope that part of my success is that it's because it was the work that I, I would make anyway. Um, I mean, certainly questions of scale and those change, but, but I think you have to do what, yeah, what you would in, you know, in your bedroom at home or, or on the dining table or something like that. Um, because that's the only thing that's gonna keep you going, ultimately. Thank you very much. Um, I know Fong Bui would like to ask a question. PB, are you in the house? I can see your beautiful studio. Um, he's incoming. Wow, <laughs> amazing glasses. Hey. Hey, Fong. How are you? I'm good, I'm having fun. Well, I think everyone is too. Um, terrific show, Lou. It's, Thanks. Uh, it's uh, incredible leaps in the last time last show but also when i first you know 
discovered your work at the shop for Lentus. So you're right, it's only three years ago you were there. Shark uh, was actually last year. Was it last year? Yeah, yeah, 2018 to 2019. That's amazing. Well, um, I can say this about um, having watched you, you know, grow since then, as you <laughs> indicated, it's four years um, span of being a painter, really. Um, the 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 what the wonder the wonderment of, of what you've been doing really remind me so much of the mediation of what is original. I remember Edward Young, one of my favorite poets, who once say, "Why is it that we all born originals, but die as copies?" Mm. And then, and then like Apollinaire, who say the opposite, you know, hundred something years later, when he declare that if even if nothing is new under the sun, the new spirit does not refrain from discovering new profundities in all this that is not new under the sun. So my question is simple. I know that your first discovery of Picasso, whether it's Cubist period or the neoclassical phase that he go through, one back to back, I mean, it was so stunning as we all remember. I mean, he would paint in the morning, sometimes a synthetic cubist painting. In the afternoon, he'll do a neoclassical painting. In the same day, essentially, we have proof of this. Um, and then your love Matisse is very evident in the way in which you deploy uh, arabesque motif and all the wonderful curve, lean, curvy linear. But I'm so interested, particularly in this show, um, that it seemed to be a shift of direction to, to be more open to a certain American romantic tradition, even dark tradition, where the Hartley um, and even Ryder or, you know, I, I, uh, Arthur Dove, as Lewis mentioned. So that very interesting mediation between European modernism, the American, early 20th century too. Um, so this is what the, you know, the show seemed to have, uh, mediation of the two. Um, so I just wondering when, is it, was it a formal decision or was it something that occurred while you are making the work from, the, from like a year before? Was it a gradual development or is it something quite abrupt? I think it was a gradual development and I hope this is true because, but it may not be, but I read that the human embryo, as it develops from a zygote to an infant, goes through our evolu evolutionary stages. Like that's why at some point in the womb, we have gills or hair covering our body. Mm -hmm. And I feel the same as an artist that you kind of digest art history as you learn to paint in a certain way. And I sort of feel like when you're a kid, you're making work that is most similar to the most archaic forms of art making. And then, you know, you, as you move throughout history, you kind of wear its clothes, or I feel like. And maybe I'm just in, in the stage where, as I gain facility with the work, I'm able to kind of expand what my interests are and have them more included. Um, so I think it's a gradual thing. I think it's, it's a, that was a very roundabout way of saying that I think it happened um, unintentionally. Yeah, you mentioned Toni Morrison earlier. And one of the things that we all admire Toni Morrison is that she has both capacities to um, evoke a narrative, but at the same time she takes incredible, tremendous liberty to play great deal of abstraction or ambiguity. And one of the things that I, I have, I have um, dinner with her once, it was amazing. And we talk about pretty much right after her Nobel Prize speech, you know? So that must have been in the mid, early or mid nineties. But one of the things that always stuck with me when she uh, say the first sentence of our childhood and we all remember the phrase, one upon a time. So to me, that narrative quality in your work um, is very present, even though it's not always that clear and accessible. 
So it go back to your discovery being gay and uh, how early was that and how, how it began to manifest in the work. Was it already undergraduate or something that gradually happened after Micah? Um, I came out as an undergraduate student in 2014 and there, I think there was a shift directly after that where I was allowed to paint the male form, paint my desire for the male form and not feel like I had to kind of hide it under layers of things or, um, yeah, I mean, I was able to, I was out in the painting also. So, so that was a, a big change. And, um, I think the thing that's happening now is maybe I'm allowed, allowing myself to return to my very early interest in painting that Lewis remembers from undergrad, um, where I was painting rooms and small details and things that maybe did not relate so directly um, to my coming out. And, and now I can kind of live more fully both ways in a certain way or, or have them live comfortably together. Mm -hmm. But I think also overall the work has always been about the same things. Um, I don't, yeah, I, I, in the same way that whether you're out to your family or your peers, um, you're always who you are. And yeah, so I don't, I don't know that I think about the work that I made before I was out as kind of belonging to one version of myself and then after a, the current one. No, it's, it's terrific to see the evidence and, and how much, uh, you know, transparency that can be shown through the, the paint, really, the way that... Yeah, you... I think that's part of the power for painting for me is that I can talk about things that are impossible to talk about um, because painting is talking to myself only until all of a sudden it's talking to everyone and that's kind of the thrill of painting. Okay. Cool. Last question before someone else may ask. I can just go forever, but Lula <laughs> point out uh, that little phase in the um, the dance party, the you know the big painting, where you took the liberty to improvise or paint on the spot, right and right the very very top on the right there, exactly. So it, I wanted to, to ask one question in regard, regarding to scale. I think that we all know from cubism, it's allowed you to um, amplify the, that kind of spatial, you know, tension or equilibrium, however way you want to put it. But in, I think that if you were to um, have the, that similar liberty, to what extent? I mean, I'm just expanding to what Lewis was saying there in, in the sense of scale, you know what I mean? I mean, scale, is it scale to you? Is it visceral? Is it an intuitive rapport to uh, images or something that you, you, you need to premeditate a bit beforehand? How do you? I, I don't premeditate at all. I actually have a friend of mine, Danny Orchard, was telling me that she was just going to the Met and jotting down dimensions of painting she liked and then ordering canvases. And I started doing that for painters I liked, it's like things Matisse had made, things Delacroix had made. Um, and, and then through drawing, thinking what, what would work. Um, and I feel like this painting was one, you know, it's so full of bodies, it's so full of information that um, it made sense to make it a large scale. And I think that the, the scale question for me does boil down to kind of uh, a, a quantity of information or detail. And, and I like that the large scale work offers so much opportunity for that. Whereas the small paintings, it's just physically harder, even though, you know, Persian miniature painting and uh, Vermeer's are full of life and information. So I want to try to do both. And I think that I'm happy that Lewis showed the, both those table paintings together. Cause I think I also want to make paintings that, function similarly at any scale, um, that there's like an inherent formal success to them regardless of their size. Yeah, this painting is interesting too, as Lewis pointed out, because 
the way in which the volume is being painted, Lu, you know, the, the modeling between dark to, to lighter tone, um, it seems to have carrying that rhythm. So it's playing both between flatness and form. You know, so it, uh, to me, that's probably, wouldn't you say it is come, it, I mean, that comes from directly an intuitive process too. Yeah, yeah, and also from my interest in bas relief sculpture, I'm thinking about those massive uh, reliefs that Matisse made of the backs. I mean, they're pretty yes, yes. Uh, directly referenced here, and and monumentality of those friezes made for uh, the Roman cities too, of processions of people. Um, I think all of that kind of is part of my decision for scale, and definitely for this painting. Yeah, great. Well, thank you, Lou. Yeah, thank you. Back to you, Sophia. Awesome. Thanks very much. Um, this has been such a pleasure to have you. Um, and thanks for, thanks for spending lunch together. Yeah, um, thank you guys. We are very lucky to have Yuna Kwek here today to read us poetry to close. Um, so I'll hand the mic over to her once I introduce her and um, we can all together end the, end the event with our daily ritual of poetry to give our spirit strength for the remainder of the day. Um, so Yuna Kwak is a poet, translator, and teacher. Her first poetry collection entitled Servi was published this year by Fathom Books. She lives in the Inland Empire. Uh, Yuna, over to you. Thanks so much to everyone at the rail, especially Sophia and Catherine. Thank you to Lewis and Lewis for inviting me into the space of this conversation. Um, I'll just let serendipity um, choose this poem for me. It's something that came to my mind as I was listening. Um, also, Lewis, I wanted to mention that I also grew up in Maryland. Oh. And that I hope that you will let me steal all summer light is Maryland light. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's yours. I would love to use that sometime. <laughs> cool. um, this poem is called After the Flood. After the flood, first my maker chose me well, then his panegyric pupil chose me, then the nuncio of beauty chose me, then I chose and chose myself, fair for trade and flit searching, chose me, finding one ripe cherry left to bulge the cheek and sting the mouth that chose me, dancing in the grove of bed fleas stuffed with chosen fruit. If you were chosen, would you wreck me under wing? If azure bluebird asking entrance to your garden, would you stay or would corral me? One hand chose to eave your face from outward looking. One hand plucks the heart rent from the heap. Or exigence intended when you purse your lip around my lip and suckling sound that follows, is that not a choosing kiss? I'll flatter you beyond the pale. I'll flatter you be crowned and choose me in the statesman's quarters lay me down and choose me, curtains damask, hide you, choose me, I am becoming to your lasting sense. Hold me chosen in your arms, every chosen, kept chosen, artless chosen, vines trampled, dear unlocking antler from the spruce, let it all depend on cliff swallows, ecstatically adduced, then electrify the choosing after. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you, Yuna. A, a really gorgeous, fitting way um, for us to, to end our lunch together. Um, Thank you for everyone who tuned in. Um, please know that we're here uh, every day, Monday through Friday at 1 p.m. Um, and tomorrow we'll be speaking with artist Olafur Eliasson and real editor, Dr. Julie Rees. Um, we'll also be with a reading from Valerie Deus. So, um, you can check our website for more updates on that. Um, otherwise, wishing you all a very pleasant Monday. Um, you are welcome to turn your microphones on to shout out your hellos and goodbyes as you leave. Um, thanks, Lewis, and thank you, Yuna. Yeah. Thank you, guys. That was so beautiful, Yuna. Thank you. Thank thank you. They're really uh, wonderful. Love that poem. <laughs> thanks, Lewis and Lewis. Yeah, thank you, guys. <laughs> thank you, Lewis. Oh, Lewis, thank you, Lewis. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's Lewis.
Hi, Keisha. Hi. Good to see you. It's a highly recommended show to see, and and so I hope you get a chance to see it. It's uh, it's Lou second show. It's quite amazing. And, um, and it's up for three more weeks. Is that right, Lou? Till November fourteenth. Yeah, and uh, he's fearless, and uh, the painting is getting handsome, and so is he. He's. <laughs> I just, I just adore it. Uh, congratulations! Thank you, Yona, for a beautiful reading, and sending love and courage, you guys. And go vote. And yeah. go vote. Yes, absolutely. Hi, Raymond. Go vote. Uh, hello. I just. Uh, hey, Raymond. I Hi, see. so many good friends here. Oh, well done for voting, Andrew. Yeah, Andrew! <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, absolutely. So keep, keep, keep up great, great work and uh, let's get some lunch, okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank bye, you so much. Okay, bye. 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 That's my grandma. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Ah! <laughs> Love and courage. Hello. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Ciao. Gracias. Bye, everyone.